All right. I'm Sarah Lambert, and I am an assistant professor at Yale School of Medicine. And today we're going to be talking about hydrourethral nephrosis, uh, mega ureter, and beyond. So we'll be talking about di ureteral dilation of varying etiologies. And we'll start from there. I have no relevant disclosures. So as basics for the ureter and the UVJ, the normal ureteral diameter as determined by anatomy um, field research and also radiology through IVPs is about 0.5 to 0.65 centimeters. Um, as we know, the duplex collecting system is present in many of the kids we see. It's more common um, to find them in patients who are presenting with symptoms, uh, but the overall healthy adult population has about 0.7% of patients with duplex collecting systems. And as a reminder of the Weigert-Meyer rule, for complete duplications, the upper pole will insert into the urogenital sinus and bladder medially and distally, whereas the lower pole will insert laterally and proximally. And Mackie Stevens added on to that that the upper pole will obstruct and the lower pole will reflux. So hydrourethral nephrosis falls under the under the hydronephrosis umbrella, and it is a common referral to pediatric urology. These days, we typically see patients sent to us prenatally. Occasionally, we will see patients who are symptomatic and other patients who have incidental findings on imaging for other reasons. Hydronephrosis is the most commonly detected anomaly in prenatal ultrasounds. We see a lot of patients in our offices, and it's approximately 1% to 5% of pregnancies have pyelectasis or some degree of hydronephrosis antenatally. Hydroureteronephrosis falls under this umbrella, and it is a ureteral dilation of greater than or equal to seven millimeters is an accepted diagnosis. Uh, mega ureter itself is a description of the ureteral dilatation, where it does not provide an etiology. Um, mega ureter can be associated with renal pelvis dilation uh, or not. And there's no correlation between the presence of a prenatal diagnosed dilated ureter and the postnatal diagnosis. So although you may see that, it is difficult to tell those families um, whether or not there will be reflux, obstruction, or neither of the above, or a secondary problem in the bladder. So looking at antenatal hydronephrosis, the most common thing we're gonna see in our office, or maybe they not, may not make it to our office, is that the dilation is transient, it's physiologic, and it resolves spontaneously. So that's about 50 to 70% of patients that we will see and fetal ultrasounds. Most, second most common is going to be your UPJ obstruction and your vesicoureteral reflux. So mega ureters, meaning the four categorizations of mega ureter, uh, including primary obstructing mega ureter, is going to be 5 to 15 percent. And then much less common are going to be your ureter seals, your ectopic ureters, and your duplex systems. So today we're going to talk about the mega ureter variations, ureter seal, ectopic ureters, uh, and briefly duplex systems as they relate to ureter seals and ectopic ureters. So when you think about these children coming into your office for their prenatal evaluation, one of the most important things to think about is not just the dilation in the kidney itself, but of course the amniotic fluid. You want to make sure these patients are not oligohydramic or there's any issues with their kidneys that are causing those um, concerns. It's important to recognize if it's unilateral or bilateral disease. Obviously, we're more concerned if it's bilateral, especially if it's really associated with a decreased AFI. You want to look at the renal parenchyma itself, if there's any cysts if there's any abnormalities, if it's echogenic. Um, sometimes a duplex system will actually be described as an upper pole renal cyst antenatally. Um, don't mistake, that can also be a duplex system. You wanna look for your renal dilation, which again is much less common, and then whether or not the bladder itself is normal. So the SFU grading scale uh, is fairly straightforward, although it is fairly subjective uh, and um, more qualitative than quantitative. Uh, but it's a interpretation of the KLCL dilation and parenchymal appearance. So those are the two factors that go into the SFU grading scale. It does not account for the ureter and bladder. So the patient population we're discussing today, it is less helpful for. Um, and the good news is that there's a high resolution rate for SFU grades one to two, but much less likely for spontaneous resolution in the higher grades three and four. 
So the urinary tract dilation score is going to be much more helpful for the patients we're talking about today. There's seven points on the score. It's going to be the anterior, posterior, renal, pelvic diameter, the AP diameter, the calosteal dilatation. Uh, there's a differentiating between um, peripheral and central calosteal dilation, but calosteal dilation is one of the categories. Uh, renal parenchymal thickness, renal parenchymal appearance, ureteral abnormalities, bladder abnormalities, and oligohydramnios. And this is hydroureteronephrosis on an antenatal uh, ultrasound. So antenatally, we break these categories into two um, categories. Our patients are going to fall into the UTDA23, um, and that's because of the abnormal ureter. So at, at best, these patients will fall into the second category, um, given the ureteral dilation, and that affects their management. So these patients are going to be managed with more frequent ultrasounds um, than patients who are in category A1 uh, with just calosteal dilatation without ureterectasis um, or any bladder abnormalities. So they are going to have their postnatal ultrasound at 48 hours and uh, most people would recommend repeat serial imaging. Um, there's going to be a need for more closer imaging and a more urgent evaluation if there's concern for bladder outlet obstruction, bilateral obstruction, or a solitary kidney that's affected. So when we think about prenatal intervention for hydroureteral nephrosis, it's primarily for bladder outlet obstruction. It would be if it affects both kidneys and if there's oligohydroamnios. Um, it's not within the scope of this talk to go over amniotic shunts or parameters uh, regarding indications for that, but a vescoamniotic shunt would be one of the considered prenatal interventions. Again, that's for bladder outlet obstruction. And there is some discussion and some groups have published um, studies on cystoscopic anterograde valve ablation. Um, and there's no indication right now for prenatal intervention for a UVJ obstruction or a UPJ obstruction, although there have been some descriptions of puncturing of your reader seals. So our post management, our postnatal management goals will be to preserve our renal function, minimize infection risk, and achieve urinary continence for those who are incontinent, primarily with ectopic ureters. So we're going to determine if we need to correct for obstruction or reflux, and especially in mega ureters, or say, there's a trend towards observation. So when we think about the patient's history, a lot of these patients will come to us with antenatal hydroureteronephrosis. They are mostly asymptomatic. We may see them prenatally. Um, if they are not picked up prenatally on ultrasounds, they can have if issues in the newborn period, which would include failure to thrive, feeding difficulties, febrile urinary tract infections, hematuria, or uh, an occasional flank mass, which is how they typically used to present more commonly before antenatal imaging. Other children can present later in life with a symptomatic presentation. That could be a urinary tract infection. For ectopic ureters, boys can develop epididymitis. Any boy who is prepubertal who has a bacterial epididymitis should really have a renal and bladder ultrasound performed as well to look for a cause. Um, urinary incontinence can occur in girls with ectopic ureters, not in boys. Um, and Flank pain can be a presenting symptom. Uh, these patients can develop nephrolithiasis in their dilated system, so it's an important thing to remember, especially going into adulthood or in a translation, transitional clinic. Hematuria and hypertension. So on physical exam, that abdominal mass, potentially fever or signs of infection. Girls can present rarely, but with a prolapsed ureter seal. So if you're looking in the introitus, this is an image of a prolapsed ureter seal, which should not be confused with a urethral prolapse, which should look more like a donut, a uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, which would look more like a cluster of grapes, or an imperfect hymen, uh, which would be smoother, um, sometimes bluish, depending on what type of fluid is behind it. And sometimes you can note these girls to have an ectopic ureteral orifice visible or a continuous incontinence if you're examining them in the diaper. There can be purulent discharge if there's an ectopic ureter that is infected and your urine culture may be negative, but you may see this discharge uh, from the perineum. So on ultrasound, we're going to assess the renal parenchyma and it's really going to be the bladder imaging that's going to help to differentiate uh, the cause of the hydroureteral nephrosis. So a ureter seal would be one thing we would be looking for, or an ectopic ureter versus the mega ureter itself. And a ureter seal is going to be thin-walled, classically, with a cystic dilation. It's going to be intravesical, and there'll be an acute angle. So you're just having that thin ureter seal, 
versus the actual detrusor muscle um, and layers of the bladder. So an ectopic ureter is going to appear more thick-walled. There's usually an extra vesicle component, and it's going to have an obtuse angle uh, to its imaging within the bladder. And in compared to a ureteroceal or a mega ureter, typically a ectopic ureter is more likely to have dysplastic parenchyma associated with it. So these are images of a single system ureteroceal and a duplex system ureteroceal. These are the thin wall ureteroceals with an acute angle here versus a pseudo ureteroceal, which would have more of an obtuse angle. Classically, this is your dilated ureter and this is a small ureteroceal associated with this single system um, over here. So when we think about our UTD classification and our ultrasound postnatally after 48 hours, our patients are again going to be either intermediate risk or high risk. Um, and the high risk patients are going to have associated parenchymal abnormalities in thickness or appearance. Um, they may or not have an abnormal bladder. Although if the in etiology is a primary um, mega ureter or ectopic ureter, uh, the likelihood of them having an abnormal bladder is low unless it's a bilateral ectopic ureter. So when we think about the recommendations for these categories um, for intermediate and high risk, all these patients are going to have a renal bladder ultrasound within their 48 hours and one to three months. A VCUG is recommended for those with high risk or other concerning findings, and it is at the discretion of the clinician uh, for the intermediate risk. I would argue that with distal ureteral dilation, depending on the degree, I would be more likely to perform a VCUG than not. Um, Similarly, antibiotics are at the discretion for the intermediate risk, which is just the abnormal ureter, and they are recommended for patients with high risk. And the functional scans are both at the discretion of the clinician. So when we think about our differential diagnosis, it's helpful to think of it in primary versus secondary. Primary being the mega ureter variations. Ureter seals, singular duplex, or ectopic ureters, and the secondary Diet causes or etiologies would be bladder outlet obstruction, most commonly posterior urethral valves, but there are other causes, neurogenic bladder, boom belly syndrome, and there are patients who develop stone disease, obviously, with hydroureter nephrosis and stricture disease as well, although less common in, in infancy. So the question arises is whether these patients should be on antibiotic prophylaxis. And the man, one of our management goals is to minimize infection risk. I put these patients on antibiotic prophylaxis if they have distal ureteral dilation. Um, not everybody does that. It is recommended in the UTD uh, guidelines for high-risk patients. And if you look at risk factors for UTIs within children, distal ureteral dilation increases the risk of UTI, age less than six months increases the risk girls and uncircumcised boys. So that's helpful when you're seeing prenatal or immediately postnatal patients uh, who are in with that less than six months age group. I start my prophylaxis before the VCUG um, to prevent any, to best prevent any chance of infection from the VCUG itself. Uh, so if we look at just mega ureter and antibiotic prophylaxis, there's a higher risk of UTI in patients with a UVJ obstruction versus a UPJ obstruction. And again, that's most common in less than six months of age. The incidence of UTI is approximately one per year if these patients don't have antibiotics or intervention performed before. And by starting a antibiotic prophylaxis in the first zero to six months, there's an 83% decreased incidence of urinary tract infection. In a study looking up to one year of age, there's a 55% decrease. So while most of that is in the first zero to six months, there's still a benefit with a 55% decrease uh, in the first year. And 35% of patients with primary obstructing mega ureter can ultimately be hospitalized for a UTI. That's a German study, so their indications for hospitalization, hospitalization may be slightly different than ours here, um, but it's an important to note. And then the British Association of Pediatric Urologists recommend uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for the first 12 to six, to 6 to 12 months of life for these children. So the other mainstay of our postnatal evaluation would be the VCUG. Again, it is recommended by the UDT high-risk category. It is also recommended by the SFU consensus statement for hydroureter when there is bilateral dilation abnormal renal parenchyma, or abnormal bladder architecture. 
the reflux guidelines from the AUA recommend ABCUG for infants with hydroureter as well in the setting of concern for reflux. And it states that there's clinician discretion if it's unilateral and the kidney appears to have normal parenchyma and bladder. The word of caution about that is there are some boys with posterior urethral valves who will have unilateral dilatation. Um, and you may miss that without performing the VCUG, although 87% of those patients uh, will have bladder abnormalities associated with that as well. So most of those boys you'll pick up with bladder abnormalities, even in the setting of a unilateral hydroureter nephrosis. That's something to keep in mind. So our VCUG will tell us good information about the upper tracts and uh, the bladder as well. So this is a classic finding of your drooping lily, and this is your duplex system, your upper pole up here in your refluxing lower pole versus the normal over here. And when we think of the bladder, you can easily see this ureter seal. They're not always that easy to see. I would implore you to look at the early filling images to make sure you're not missing a ureter seal. When the bladder is very full, they can be um, missed due to the density of the contrast, and they can also evert and look more like a diverticulum if you miss them, and the bladder is filled. This is a boy with bilateral hydroureter nephrosis, but if you note down here, he has posterior urethral valves. So it's important to remember that there are other secondary causes um, of hydroureter nephrosis and not to miss those. So when we think about the functional assessment for these patients in general, our mainstay is the MAG3 renal scan. I would recommend performing it in the absence of bladder outlet obstruction or vesicle ureteral reflux. If you clearly have reflux or posterior urethral valves or another sign of infection, I don't think it's necessarily warranted in the initial workup. Uh, it is recommended, again, by the British Society um, with ureteral dilatation greater than 10 millimeters. And it is recommended by many if there's associated parenchymal thinning as well. The DMSA renal scan, will provide the best assessment for the function of that kidney and could be potentially indicated if you're considering an extirpative upper tract um, hemi-nephrectomy or nephrectomy for an ectopic ureter or a non-functioning upper pole. MRU and MRI are excellent. I think MRU grams, if you can obtain them, are wonderful. They delineate complex anatomy and they have a high sensitivity and specificity for the non-dilated ectopic ureter if you're unsure from your ultrasound findings. So when we think of managing these children, most of them can be observed initially. There are some indications for urgent management. One would be infection, bilateral obstruction, or bladder outlet obstruction. And from our three primary causes being ectopic ureter, mega ureter, and ureter seal, the only one that will cause bilateral outlet obstruction would be the prolapsed ureter seal, which is rare but can lead to changes in the bladder uh, remodeling and affect both sides uh, bilaterally. So these patients can be treated with antibiotics, with ureter seal puncture, with a percutaneous nephrostomy tube, which are unfortunately uh, prone to dislodgement infection or uh, serial replacement, depending on how long you plan on leaving those in. A cutaneous ureterostomy is a good option. Um, to dilate, it avoids operation on the bladder in small children. Uh, they are at risk for stromal stenosis, pyelonephritis, and if you have bilateral ectopic ureters or bilateral ureter seals and you're considering this, you have to realize that you could be potentially defunctionalizing the bladder. In the case of bilateral ectopic ureters, it may already have a significant amount of dysfunction. Um, already. Bladder marsupialization or a side-to-side -side anastomosis between the ureter and the bladder is an option. It's a deliberate refluxing, re-implant. It is not performed at the trigone and it is sort of quote-unquote the lesser evil of vesicoureteral reflux uh, rather than obstruction. It allows for the maintenance of bladder cycling and bilateral disease and there is a risk of UTI with the reflux. So going into each etiology separately. The ureter seal is the cystic dilation of the distal ureter. This is a large intravesical ureter seal. Uh, they can be unilateral or bilateral, single system or duplex system. They are associated with the upper pole in the duplex system. And although there's many different um, descriptions, sequel ureter seal, sphincteric, sequel sphincteric, um, stenotic sphincteric, their main differences or the most important factor to take home would be intravesical versus extravesical and that's whether it's above the bladder neck or not and that is going to affect your repair if your ureter seal goes beneath the bladder neck there is risk for 
obstruction and there's risk for needing to repair the bladder neck itself. So it makes it more challenging. And a prolapse ureter seal is obviously a unique uh, situation as well, which will be treated initially by puncture. There have been reports of puncturing it at the bedside itself without requiring to go to the operating room. So in patients with ureter seal, we want to improve their drainage and function, but we also want to minimize their risk of reflux. So by puncturing the ureter seal, which is oftentimes an initial management for a functioning system, um, we try to minimize that risk and avoid further operation. So our indications for intervention, I would argue, are decreased renal function, whether they are symptomatic with urinary tract infection or pain, bilateral ureter seals, or the prolapsed obstructed ureter seal. There are small single system intravesical ureter seals that are not associated with significant uh, obstruction of the upper tract, although I would argue that they require surveillance as some of these patients into adulthood can develop urinary tract infections, stone formation within the ureter seal, and some upper tract deterioration as well, uh, even if they've been discharged from follow-up. So the ureteral seal puncture is an initial first step to decompress and relieve the obstruction. It's performed cystoscopically with the exception of the prolapsed ureteral seal that you may be able to puncture at the bedside. The success of the relief of obstruction is anywhere between 78 and 97 percent. It can be performed classically with a low transverse incision or a watering can puncture via laser. Um, that's multiple punctures throughout and the benefit of the watering can it's a potential decrease in de novo vesicle ureteral reflux um, from the authors described. The risk of ureter seal puncture would be creation of reflux. It's important to remember that some of these patients will have upper pole or, I'm sorry, lower pole or contralateral vesicle ureteral reflux preceding puncture, uh, but even if they do not, they can have de novo vesicle ureteral reflux. I would caution you with the extension into the urethra, so a extra vesicle um, or ectopic ureter seal as you can have a windsock effect. So depending on where that puncture is, it's possible when the child voids that the distal end of the ureter seal can still fill and therefore obstruct the urethra. So the cure, um, and I'm using that with an asterisk because it's looking at VCUGs initially performed um, after the decompression, but reflux can recur later in these children and has been seen that with a negative VCUG initially, you can still later on have children who develop symptoms of infection on recurrent reflux. Um, but the cure rate of patients who will not require another procedure is 55 to 80 percent in the single system. This is more complex in those ectopic ureter seals and is only about 29 percent and even less so in a duplex system. And some of that is accounted for by the lower pole reflux that's associated with the ureter seal. There is a benefit to decompressing the ureter seal aside from relieving the obstruction, even if you have to go back um, for a reimplantation, and that is that you've decompressed it and the ureter, ure, ureter itself uh, can decompress and your diameter will decrease. It's a little awkward discussing without an, an audience. <laughs> Um, operative interventions for ureter seal include ureteral excision with a ureteral reimplantation. This is a good option for both a single system and a duplex system. You can do a common sheath repair. If there's any concern that it extends into the bladder neck, the bladder neck can be reconstructed and hopefully prevent any incontinence. And the same thing for the posterior wall of the bladder if there's a large defect from a large ureter seal. Uh, if you look at patients who had a ureter seal puncture or underwent a hemi-nephrectomy but had your vesical ureteral reflux prior to their intervention, 85% of those will require a reimplant. It's a nice study from um, Dr. Huseman. Uh, so I would consider if anybody had pre existing vesical ureteral reflux, that the ureter seal excision and reimplantation would be their best option. You can have recurrent reflux after your reimplantation, and if you're not careful, you can create obstruction with those sequel ureter seals in the urethra. The ureteral ureterostomy is a good option if there's no lower pole reflux, and it has been used from upper pole to lower pole for systems that have significant upper pole function or even in systems with less upper pole function um, as a viable option to prevent uh, operating on the kidney itself or at the level of the bladder. There's a risk of obstruction to the lower pole ureter, which you have to take into account. Um, upper pole heminephrectomy plus or minus ureteral excision it would be your superior approach. It's a good option for a non-functioning upper pole 
and there's no lower pole vesicular ureteral reflux, there is a risk of damage to the lower pole and a risk of de novo vesicular ureteral reflux. The risk of damage to the lower pole seems to be relatively small, and you look at the large series or a few series of small, small retrospective studies, um, but there is that risk of de novo VUR as well. So if we move on to an ectopic ureter, an ectopic ureter is simply described as a ureter that does not enter the trigone. It's in 0.3 to 6% of the population. It can be bilateral, although it's most commonly unilateral. It is more common in girls than boys. 80% uh, are associated with duplex systems. Uh, single system ectopic ureters are more common in boys than girls. So we think about the location of ureteral ectopia. Girls, it's most commonly present in the urethra that can be found in the vestibule, vagina, and uterus. You can see from Campbell's, that nice um, diagram there, displaying everywhere, um, you can find the ectopic ureters in girls. And in boys, it's most commonly in the posterior urethra, followed by the seminal vesicles. Much less commonly would be the ejaculatory duct or the vas deferens. So when we think of a clinical presentation for a, an ectopic ureter, this is a CT scan of a duplex system with an upper pole ectopic ureter uh, and a child, teenager who presented with UTIs. Um, so in boys, they will have no incontinence, but they can have UTI and epididymitis. So again, in a prepubertal boy with a bacterial epididymitis, he should definitely have an imaging of his kidneys and bladder. They can also present with uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, including urgency and frequency. Girls can present with continuous incontinence, and it's important to tease that out with families because some families say she's wet all the time, but that doesn't mean she's actually constantly wet. It just means she's frequently wet, but has dry intervals. There can be a vaginal discharge or UTI, and girls can also have lower urinary tract um, symptoms. So we would treat these patients in the emergent setting with antibiotics first. If they don't respond well to antibiotics, they may need drainage. Um, including a percutaneous nephrostomy tube or cutaneous ureterostomy if they don't respond appropriately. So our treatments are similar to what we heard previously. Uh, for a non-functioning system, a nephrectomy or a heminephrectomy would be a good option. Um, there is debate as to the distal ureter and how much of a ureterectomy needs to be performed. I think the more ureter you can remove, the better. Obviously, dissecting it down to the level of the bladder neck can lead to problems with incontinence. Um, but if you're doing this laparoscopically or robotically, I would say as low as you can dissect that ureter would be the best, in my opinion. Um, ureter reimplantation allows for bladder neck reconstruction, common sheath repair, um, and you can also refix any lower pole or contralateral vesicle ureteral reflux at the same time. A ureter ureterostomy is a great option. Again, it's going to be performed in a minimally evasive fashion. Uh, but you really preferably would have a patient without any lower pole or reflux. And as I stated, there's a discussion about the ureteral stump for the hemi-nephrectomy, and that same discussion holds true when you do a ureter ureterostomy with a uh, distal stump of the upper pole ureter. Moving on to mega ureters, there are four types of mega ureters a non-obstructed, non-refluxing mega ureter, an obstructed mega ureter, refluxing mega ureter, and obstructed refluxing. So when we think of the term mega ureter, most people think of a primary obstructing mega ureter. There are secondary causes of each of these, um, and we'll be focusing the rest of this discussion on the primary obstructing mega ureter. A refluxing mega ureter you would treat with reflux. Um, obstructing refluxing is often a mega uh, ureter that is near the bladder neck um, and a non-obstructed non-refluxing can be from large uh, urinary volumes or something that is transient that will resolve spontaneously. So the primary obstructing mega ureter is a dilated ureter with an adynamic segment at or near the UVJ. There are a lot of descriptions as to why this is occurring um, but Primarily, the, de the development of the ureteral musculature, as described both in the sheep model and in humans, is a cranial to caudal muscle development. So when we think of these patients who oftentimes improve spontaneously over their first year of life with a primary obstructing mega ureter, it may be that that intravesical ureteral portion is maturing after they're born uh, and then normalizes. 
the reflux in megaurea is most commonly related to vesicoureteral reflux. And as I stated uh, earlier, a refluxing obstructing megaurea is most likely an ectopic ureter to the bladder, neck, or sphincter. Primary obstructing megaureters are more common in boys. They're more common on the left than the right. 25% can be bilateral. And it's important to remember that 10 to 15% are also associated with other contralateral anomalies, including reflux and UPJ obstruction. Today, they're typically detected on prenatal ultrasound and the children are asymptomatic. So although the AUA doesn't have any guideline or consensus statement on the management of the primary obstructing mega ureter, the British Association of Pediatric Urology does. Uh, and you, looking at their consensus statement, which was drawn in a review of literature and expert opinion, uh, they agree that a ureteral diameter of greater than seven millimeters would be considered a mega ureter. Um, they are mostly diagnosed with prenatally, and those patients who are presenting to them in a prenatal fashion, they recommend antibiotic prophylaxis, an ultrasound and VCUG after birth, and a MAG3 renal scan if vesicle ureteral reflux and bladder outlet obstruction are excluded. They also comment on the trend towards conservative management and find this reasonable for many patients uh, who don't have a high obstruction. So their indications for intervention would be a febrile urinary tract infection, pain, or a differential renal function less than 40%, or a serial decrease in differential renal function of greater than 5% consistent with obstruction um, and the need to intervene. They also comment that in patients who have progressive hydronephrosis that is severe, they would warrant an intervention as well. So when we think about the primary obstructing mega ureters that are being observed, 73 to 85% show long-term spontaneous resolution, which is great news. The time to resolution inversely is related to the diameter. So diameters of less than 8.5 millimeters are, have a high likelihood of resolution, and diameters greater than 1.5 millimeters have a I'm sorry, 1.5 centimeters have a much less likelihood of spontaneous resolution. So that's helpful for you as a clinician and also to speak with your families when you first meet these patients um, related to the degree of severity of their distal hydroureteral nephrosis. Uh, a diameter greater than one centimeter has a higher risk for complications. Those include urinary tract infection, nephrolithiasis, and pain, and 21% of those will require intervention. It's important to recognize that some children who have been followed since infancy for mega ureters can worsen at puberty and beyond. Uh, there have been patients who have found to develop nephrolithiasis, unfortunately chron um, chronic renal failure from bilateral obstruction um, that was discharged from follow-up, and serial ultrasounds and MAG3 renal scans are warranted if necessary. I would recommend ultrasounds and as long as there's no worsening and you can avoid the MAG3 renal scan but it's important to realize that some of these patients uh, do worsen over time. So when we think about intervention for primary obstructing mega ureters, ureter reimplantation is typically performed between nine and 18 months of age. This is with the theory uh, not provide, trying to reimplant a large ureter through a small infant bladder at the risk of causing uh, bladder dysfunction. There have been some authors who've recently argued that you can perform these repairs at um, six months without much difficulty in how they are avoiding or any bladder dynamics. There is a debate regarding ureteral tapering and multiple ways to taper a ureter. Uh, we'll discuss that momentarily for especially this reason. Um, endoscopic is another option or approach for the POM. And this is much newer uh, technique. The success rates vary in the literature from 95% to 70%. So I would say safely over 70%. 15% uh, have required endoscopic retreatment and 37% have gone on to require surgical uh, reintervention. There are different techniques. Uh, some people will use um, an endourotomy, ureterotomy. Other patients will use balloon. Other providers will use balloon dilation. Um, and most people have a limit for the length of the stricture, being somewhere between uh, one to two centimeters, and anything longer than that um, would also require endourotomy. Uh, the risks include urinary tract infection, stent migration hematuria, stone formation, and the creation of reflux. There have been a couple of descriptions in the literature of 
trauma to the ureter requiring a reimplantation at that time. And some authors argue for double stenting to prevent uh, recurrence of the stricture. Most of the stents are left in place for two months. And long-term observation is really required as this is a, uh, a newer technique and most of the series in literature are small um, retrospective or prospective series with not long follow-up. So if urgent drainage is required in these patients, much like the other patients, percutaneous nephrostomy tube, cutaneous ureterostomy, and a ureteral stent placement or bladder marsupialization if you're trying to avoid operating on the bladder itself, but allowing for cycling. So in discussing ureteral tapering, the goal is to excise the adynamic segment in your reimplantation and creating an anti-refluxing anastomosis. You want to gradually taper your ureter to prevent an area of obstruction from the end of your tapering to the dilated ureter more proximally. So the two techniques are typically plication or excisional tapering. Plication preserves the ureteral blood supply and is best for ureteral diameter less than 1.75 centimeters. Otherwise, it becomes more unwieldy and difficult to reimplant into the bladder. The star plication is performed over a catheter with Lembert sutures, um, placating to re remove the residual tissue. The Kalasinski is a folding technique and the lumen has a catheter placed in on the medial aspect of the lumen. The lateral aspect, the less blood supply is going to be folded. A running suture is um, placed alongside the catheter and then the extra portion is folded posteriorly um, and secured to the ureter. There's debate as to which is better, lumbar plication or interrupted sutures, whether or not that prevents any um, damage to the blood supply. I think it's difficult to tell from the current literature. Um, excisional tapering was discussed by, initially pioneered by Hardy Hendren. There is a risk of stenosis and ischemia. By excising that portion of the ureter, you would be excising the lateral less vascular area of the ureter itself, and it's also performed over a catheter. It may be warranted in patients who have massive ureteral dilation. So when we look at the outcomes of our reimplantation for our primary obstructing mega ureters, there's a greater than 90% success rate. In a study looking at patients who had a ureteral tapering versus no tapering, they found there was no significant difference um, in their success rates or their complications. The complications similar to any reimplantation can be ureteral obstruction or persistent or de novo vesicle ureteral reflux. There are much like our reimplants for um, vesicle ureteral reflux, there are worse outcomes with bowel and bladder dysfunction. So treating your patients for their bowel and bladder dysfunction will be very important. And in patients who have significant bowel and bladder dysfunction or neurogenic bladder, they found that there's an improved success rates with an intravesical approach versus trying to attempt to do this uh, extravesically entirely. All of our patients, we followed up with serial ultrasounds, and if there's persistent hydroureter nephrosis, a MAG3 renal scan to determine the drainage. So in summary, most of these patients are detected prenatally. Sorry if I ran through everything quickly, I had a lot of slides. Um, there's a postnatal diagnosis to typically perform with ultrasound and VCUG. I would recommend antibiotic prophylaxis, certainly for your high risk group. Um, they would require that as well. And the determination for the primary obstructing mega ureter is really whether or not these patients can be observed or do they require intervention. Luckily, most of them will be able to, um, but they do require long-term follow-up given late recurrences and complications. Um, and that's it. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay. Um, so someone is asking, in your practice, do you reimplant ureters 85% of the time after a ureter cell puncture? And I do not. Um, when I stated that, that is in patients who have pre-existing vesicle ureteral reflux in the contralateral or the lower pole ureter. So those patients will have 85% of those patients will require further intervention. So if I had a patient who prior to my puncture of the ureter seal had vesicle ureteral reflux, I would counsel those patients that they would most likely require a reimplantation. 
in a patient who has no vesicular ureteral reflux prior to puncture of their ureter seal, I like to use a laser uh, watering can approach, and I find that I have good success um, with not needing to reimplant them and not having de novo reflux occur. So that, that's the difference in those 85%, and those are patients who had pre-existing vesicular ureteral reflux, either contralaterally or in the lower pole. Um, someone is asking, how often do you perform a hemi-nephrectomy, and how do you do it, please? To be honest, I try to avoid doing hemi-nephrectomies, um, and I prefer approaching most of these patients if there's no vesicle ureteral reflux with a ureteral ureterostomy. Uh, I think some of those upper poles do have function, and if I'm thinking of the complications from my procedure, the idea of losing, even though it's rare, um, a large portion or the lower pole um, of that kidney to me is un unacceptable as a complication. So I will typically perform a ureteral ureterostomy, and I would do that robotically. Um, if there is reflux, then I would do a reimplantation for that patient. Um, if you're doing a common sheath reimplantation, would you choose an extra or intravescal approach? I would choose an intravescal approach, is typically how I have done this. I would recommend doing the, ureter, the tapering of the ureter if you're going to be doing that extravesically and then tunneling it into the bladder um, to complete the remainder of the, the reimplant. What is the limit of length for balloon dilatation of the UVJ? Um, I think that's different for different authors, uh, but what I've seen and what has been published from the CHOP data is about three centimeters um, at most. Um, let's see, oops. I didn't go to my last slide. So please, for POM, you said that they can resolve spontaneously during the first year. Then if no UTI and function over 40%, just observe. And that's true. I think you can observe many of these, and that's what the, um, the literature has shown, too. Between 70 and 80% of these patients can be observed. Um, they can be followed by ultrasound as long as they don't have complications. I start them on prophylaxis for the first year, um, even without vesicoureteral reflux, because I think with distal dilatation, they're at risk, especially girls and uncircumcised boys who are at higher risk for UTIs anyhow. Um, and then I follow them serially with ultrasounds. They certainly get a MAG3 to begin with to determine their baseline differential renal function. And if there is any worsening of the dilatation or no improvement, then I would repeat their MAG3 renal scan to determine if they need to be uh, reimplanted or not. So POMs, at what age do you reimplant on those without UTIs and preserve renal function? Uh, so if they have equal split function, I would continue to monitor them, and I don't have a particular age that I would intervene. If the dilatation was worsening or if there is a change in their renal scan, then I would do that. But otherwise, these patients can be uh, observed. Most of them should show improvement in their dilation within the first year of life. So potentially, if they had severe dilatation and we we're two or three years of age and there was any decrease in their MAG3 renal scan, then I would, I would proceed with reimplantation at that point. But most of them can be observed and I certainly wouldn't do it in infancy. Do you have any opinion on ureterovesicostomy? Um, I think the ureterovesicostomy is the marsupialization, which I think works very well. We've done it a few times in fellowship. Um, and this would be in a patient who I find it helpful whose family is very resistant to a cutaneous ureterostomy, obviously it would be useful as well in a bilateral uh, ectopic ureter situation or a bilateral ureter seal where you don't want to defunctionalize the bladder. But even in unilateral, some families find that um, very daunting to have a cutaneous ureterostomy to care for, and there is that risk of infection uh, with a cutaneous ureterostomy or stomal stenosis. So by doing a marsupialization of the ureter to the side or dome of the bladder, I think that's very helpful for those families, and you would treat them like any other refluxing patient. Um, any opinion on ureteral clipping for non-functioning, low, low function upper pole? I have never performed any ureteral clipping. Um, I'm not sure what you would do with your distal ureter as well. Um, 
so I don't have too many opinions on that, but I would con be con concerned if the indication for the clipping was incontinence that that upper pole is going to still um, produce some urine and may cause them some symptomatic difficulties or any difficulties with the distal um, ureteral stump as well. In POM, do you use the indication cited by the BAPU? What do you do when a patient is obstructed in the MAG3 dilated on ultrasound but without UTI and normal function? I think I would follow those patients very closely. Um, MAG3s are a little more difficult to interpret given uh, hydroureteral nephrosis versus a UPJ obstruction as it depends on where you're drawing your area of interest. Um, and I would argue that if I had a high concern about their drainage from the curve, I wouldn't use the slope alone, I would use the differential function as well, but it would be someone who I would follow very closely. And if I felt there was any decrease in renal function, I would intervene. I think I've gotten them all. What's the, it looks like there's one more. What's the best time for a puncture of the ureter seal in a duplex system? Um, and I would puncture them at the same time I would puncture a sim single system, uh, which is usually within the first month of life. Um, as long as the child is healthy, and I'm confident that my anesthesiologist can um, take care of them safely, I would recommend within the first couple months of life, I would start them an antibiotic prophylaxis, and I usually do it within the first month, whether it's a duplex system or a single system. Can you please explain the watering can technique? Um, yes, I definitely can explain that. So the watering can technique is used in a laser. Uh, some people use the holmium laser, some people use the diode laser, uh, but what you're doing is you're using a large micron fiber and you're making multiple punctures within the ureter seal. Uh, and you're hoping to decompress the ureter seal and have enough uh, drainage that you won't have any reflux, but you won't have any obstruction. So it's a fine balance between making those openings uh, large enough that they don't close and seal. So I would, again, use a large fiber. Um, I like the diode laser um, because there's better tissue vaporization. And the goal is to decrease the amount of risk for vesicular ureteral reflux. If I were to use a um, hot hook, I would use a hot hook and I would use it very inferior and transversely again to decrease any uh, risk of reflux in these patients. Next question is why not just watch a small ureter seal and you can. So if there's no upper pole uh, dilatation, I think that's the most important thing. Um, you can watch a small ureter seal. You see that cobra head um, on let's say an IVP back when we used to get IVPs and those can be observed. I think many people will observe a small single system, more common in boys and girls, ureter seal that's intravesical and that's not associated with upper pole dilatation. Uh, it's important to realize that you do need to continue to follow those patients because some of them will develop stones um, or decompensate their system later on. The vast majority can be followed easily though. I do not do the watering can technique with a bug beat. People use bug beats to puncture your ureter seals. So certainly uh, if you were trying to rather than make a, a linear incision, I think the bug beat is challenging, um, but you can make a few incisions with the, or a few um, punctures with the bug beat. I think the laser works really nicely, um, but cert people certainly use a bug beat to decompress your ureter seals. And people use a hot knife or hot hook as well. Any other questions? <laughs>
Thanks everybody for listening. Sorry for a strange lecture without a, a virtual audience. I appreciate your attention.